So thank you all. It's a pleasure. We'll, we'll speak in English and uh, should there be a big problem, then please tell us and we'll translate. Um, but Divine is also fluent in French, so he can also sometimes um, do a bit of English. So it's a real, uh, of, of French, sorry. It's a real pleasure for me to introduce you to Divine Fu, who is a uh, um, a friend and colleague. He's uh, he's a professor of anthropology in uh, South Africa, University of Cape Town. He has worked in in several places in in Africa, especially Cameroon, for his PhD on 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 Cameroonian youth and uh, masculinity. He has worked on several topics and relate in in relation to. Um, to use music, health, uh, health organizations, HIV, and many things. And, and more recently, he's, uh, he's, he's developing a, a long project on, on suffering and smiling. And also, he's now heading the UMA Institute for Humanities in Africa. And there's um, a, quite an, an amazing project going on there to, to, to really focus on what's what's being human um, today in Africa. So yeah, it's my pleasure to, to give you the floor, Divine, and um, we'll, we'll have time for questions afterwards. Uh, thank you, uh, Fanny, and uh, thank you everybody for joining during this uh, launch break. Je suis ravi d'être là. Uh, and uh, I've, I've known Fanny for many, 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 many years, uh, stretching as far back as uh, Botswana when I was doing my master's. And uh, it's been a, a very good uh, friendship and special friendship since that uh, period until date. Um, and uh, uh, it's always good to try to experiment with ideas and think with ideas uh, uh, with you. As you know, with, uh, with anthropology, a joking relationship is uh, uh, a very important and special relationship. Yeah, so. Uh, so when Fanny asked me to do this uh, talk, uh, she wanted me to talk about COVID-19. Uh, but to talk about COVID-19 in relation to, uh, to Africa, but uh, uh, particularly from the pers perspective of uh, South Africa, uh, and then to find ways of you know, seeing uh, what kinds of issues to, to raise from it. And, and I think bro more broadly speaking, it was just like, what's the situation of COVID and how are people dealing uh, with the consequences of, uh, of, of COVID. So uh, what I've tried to do is, is to frame it ar around the notion of care uh, and uh, an idea that we're trying to push, uh, which is about imagining a new politics, uh, imagining a new uh, a social contract, a new political relationship, a new society, uh, which emerges out of the failures of this society uh, and the political arrangements and the social contract to deal with the consequences of this uh, a pandemic. Uh, so we are beginning to talk about a post selfless uh, society rather than a post COVID uh, society, also given that COVID is going to be with us for a long time. Uh, and also given that the, co the, the consequences of COVID are the product of preconditions that existed before COVID-19. Uh, if you move to the next slide, uh, please. Uh, so we run, we run a... We, we run a, a blog at HUMA, the uh, Institute for Humanities and, uh, in Africa, which is based at the University of Cape Town. We run a blog called Corona Times, which I uh, recommend you to visit when you have time. I think some of you might have already uh, come across. It's a blog that is curated with colleagues from uh, different parts of, uh, of the world, but it's been really key to providing uh, a kind of a social science and humanities uh, contribution you know, to uh, um, uh, the COVID-19 uh, disaster. So uh, uh, next slide, please. Yeah, so uh, my interest in care uh, has 
it seems to have been an interest that has always been there for for many years. But uh, in the past year, it was kindled by this report from uh, Oxfam, which was uh, uh, presented at the World Economic Forum early this year, just before COVID-19 happened. And it's entitled The Time to Care. And uh, this report really emphasizes uh, the the extension and expansion and deepening of inequalities, you know, uh, across the world. Um, And uh, the report, uh, apart from uh, demonstrating, you know, uh, the difference, you know, in inequality, especially between men uh, and women, shows that increasingly uh, our, our society even with attempts, you know, to address poverty and all of the issues related to it is continuously getting uh, unequal and unequal. So if you have uh, a time, I I recommend that you you read that report. Uh, But the report recommends that we need to move into a space where we begin to take care uh, more seriously. If you move to the next uh, slide, uh, the next slide uh, has the recommendations, you know, for this. Uh, and uh, uh, Care uh, Oxfam recommends that uh, we need to invest in national health systems, which are things that we really should not be reminding people for. We need to end extreme poverty. Uh, we need to ensure that uh, care that carers have influence in deci- decision making pro- uh, processes, and also really value care work and challenge harmful norms, you know, for uh, a sexist beliefs which expand you know uh, inequalities between uh, particularly men and women and within between different societies uh, if you can move to the next slide uh, 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 please the next in the next slide I try to address what care is uh, funny I could see that you were struggling also to define to translate care uh, into French uh, uh, trying to also I mean, uh, I see the challenges that I was facing, you know, uh, trying to think this, you know, through another uh, language. But in French, you know, you can, uh, what you get as a literal tra- translation is like soin, uh, les soins, which means care, treatment, attention. Uh, it's about concern, uh, carefulness, uh, uh, it's to faire attention, uh, or s'occuper ou prendre soin. Uh, also charge the load. And uh, the question I asked there is, uh, given the difficulties in this translation, can one um, argue uh, that uh, in a, a spaces such as a French society or European society, can we really say care exists? And I want to start with a provocation by saying that no, it doesn't exist. It's something else. It's a duty, you know, to the state. If you can move to the next slide, uh, uh, please. So uh, care, uh, as we use it uh, today is a term which is uh, really located within uh, 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 health. So it's been medicalized and we medicalized also because of uh, uh, the early uh, uh, works around uh, 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 care. And much of this uh, comes from the nursing field. Uh, and here care mainly uh, refers to support, uh, supportive um, or facilitative acts that uh, made towards uh, other people, or towards uh, individuals. Um, and caring is also seen here as a sustained emotional in, in investment in an individual's well-being. And is often characterized by a desire to take actions that will benefit uh, other people. So if you move to the next slide, uh, the care that I'm uh, interested in uh, is is a kind of a feminist ethic or a feminist etiquette or a kind of a politics or a feminist politics. And I'm using Eva Feder uh, to taste uh, a, a notion of what care is. And uh, she sees care as an uh, ethics of care takes caring relationships as morally fundamental uh, uh, to uh, relationships and also to value. And that care is also about affective connection. It's about, uh, it's not about calculative uh, uh, processes. It's also about a kind of uh, not just asymmetric relationships, but also symmetric uh, uh, a relationship, but it's a kind of a commitment, you know, to uh, other people. Uh, if you move to the next slide, uh, societies of care uh, are therefore societies of selflessness, 
societies of obligations as opposed to societies of rights and societies framed around uh, the messiness of a human life, uh, societies meant to protect dignity uh, of, of people and uh, societies that are organized around offering care to people and preserving life uh, rather than a duty towards you know the state or or, or, or the republic so that i try to make the difference between uh the societies of care are societies that are made of obligations and uh, societies where there's no care societies that are, are more organized around issues of of rights uh if you move to the next slide uh, uh please um and here uh i I'm trying to experiment and to provoke a discussion to say that uh, the uh, differentials in infections, you know, in in Europe and also dif uh, differences in uh, in the difficulties people are facing to uh, adhere to lockdown rules and therefore spread this uh, pandemic uh, uh, relates to the link between repo uh, republicanism and uh, a lack of humanity, which is more that uh, the republican ethic is also a kind of a duty to the republican ideal, uh, while there's a humanist uh, ethic, which is more uh, a relationship, you know, towards uh, others and care. And that is crisis of care, uh, which produces, uh, partially, I think, produces the spread of this pandemic in other uh, uh, spaces, uh, is also the product of an incomplete project of uh, uh, decoloniality or decolonization in, in European societies that was uh, hijacked by uh, this uh, very deep Republican uh, movement. So if you move to the next slide, uh, so I'm asking whether care, therefore, exists in the metropolis, and I've said it's uh, care doesn't exist. And for French society, I'm thinking that care was abandoned at the fall of the Bastille, and uh, uh, then there was a deep um, uh, a valuing of uh, the republican uh, uh, ethic uh, rather than the ethic towards uh, others. If you move to the next slide. Uh, and I try to demonstrate that in this uh, obsession with the heroism in French, uh, France, and many other parts of the world of this uh, uh, guy who uh, at some point just demonstrated his humanism, uh, but that humanism got converted or translated uh, into this uh, a professional and republican ethic, you know, through uh, either granting him citizenship or, or celebrating him, you know, uh, uh, for, for time. And I, uh, I try to argue that this uh, particular care, which is a valuing of uh, a humanism or value of the human, uh, is uh, at the core uh, aspect or the core model of Africa's uh, dealing with this relationship. Uh, and in the next slide, if you move to the next slide, I try to compare these three different models. The first is the Swedish model, which is around voluntary uh, uh, measures and personal responsibility. If you move to the next slide, the next slide uh, shows you the South Korean model, which is detection, containment, and treatment. And if you move to the next slide, the next slide is uh, for the African model, driven, uh, I think, here by by, uh, the Africa CDC, which is more a, a model around care, which affect, connect, and uh, to humanize, so humanize the virus and also humanize people. Um, and if you move to the next slide, I ask, you know, why we talk so much about the Swedish model and uh, the Korean model without the African model. Uh, I use the example of uh, 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 Cyril Ramaphosa, South African's president, and his mishap with uh, the mask, which becomes the front or the uh, uh, image, you know, for thinking about the pandemic on uh, the continent, but it's all what Ashil argues that thinking about Africa rationally uh, is not something that comes to us naturally. So uh, that said, now we can move to the pandemic itself. <laughs> you move to the next slide. Uh, you see we are right now at uh, 41 million confirmed uh, infections uh, 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 globally, you know, and uh, if you uh, see 
uh, you see 1.1 million deaths. If you move to the next slide, you see how that is distributed across uh, the world. The Americas with the highest. And if you look down, uh, Africa is almost like last, uh, but uh, one case with 1.2 million uh, uh, cases. So these are figures that you can find uh, online. So if you move to the next slide, uh, the next slide I'm comparing uh, the infections uh, in different territories. You see the infections in France and the infections in South Africa. They are almost close. France with 927,000 uh, cases and South Africa with 708. In fact, by early this morning, it was 710 uh, cases. So uh, if you move to the next slide, in the next slides, I show you the inf uh, total cases on the continent, uh, 1.6 million cases, 40,000 uh, deaths, but 1.3 million uh, recoveries, you know, and that's quite uh, high. So if you move to the next slide, uh, the next slide mainly shows you the infections in uh, South Africa. And in the past uh, uh, 24 hours or a few days or so, 48 hours or so, there have been 2,000 infections. Uh, but 708,000, uh, 18,000 deaths. And as I indicated by this morning, when I was checking just before the uh, US debate, it was at 710,000. Uh, in the last, uh, if you move to the next slide, in the last uh, briefings, which from the Ministry of Health, which is on the 21st of October, uh, you would see the, uh, that um, the recoveries are 641,000 uh, recoveries. Uh, and uh, it will tell you the number of uh, tests, which is 4.6 million tests conducted. So out of 4.6 million tests conducted, 710 cases, but 641,000 uh, recoveries and 18,000 uh, deaths. So if you move to the next slide, uh, in the next slide, there's a distribution by provinces in South Africa. Uh, itself uh, you see uh, from there that uh, the uh, highest number of infections are located in some of the main uh, cities where there are connections you see like the western cape uh, 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 and also uh, in in the Gauteng. Uh, province, the Western Cape, where I'm located. If we move to the next slide. It tells you the testing um, in in South Africa. And you see that 69% of tests have been done in the private clinics or private sector or not in the public sector. And ten, only 31% of tests uh, have, have uh, occurred in the public uh, sector. If you move to the next slide, it tells you hospitalizations, uh, 91 uh, a thousand hospitalizations for uh, COVID-19, and uh, you know, seventy over seventy thousand uh, discharges, which is quite uh, you know high a uh, 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 percentage, you know, for a recovery. If you move to the next uh, uh, slides. Uh, the next slides will uh, tell you about uh, recoveries, and we have a recovery of uh, 90%, about 90.1%, which is a recovery rate, uh, which is really quite high and really good, which uh, means that, you know, lots of people uh, 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 getting the virus are actually uh, uh, recovering. So the next slide just gives you an overview of, uh, you know, the total number of cases, the deaths, you know, the active cases, and also uh, the recoveries and uh, new cases, new deaths, and also uh, hospitalizations. If you move to the next slide, the next slide provides you with a timeline. Um, and the timeline on the uh, first case was announced on the 5th of March. Uh, the 5th of March, this was a 38-year-old man who had uh, traveled to Italy, had returned with his wife uh, and gone to the doctor on the 3rd of March. And uh, uh, after uh, showing uh, signs of the virus, uh, was tested and found positive. Uh, and by the 15th of March, uh, just to indicate that within a short period of time, one week, two week period, uh, the president declared a state of emergency on 15th of March, which is one of the toughest, uh, not a state of emergency, a state of disaster and a lockdown, which is one of the toughest lockdowns, you know, uh, across um, uh, the world. Uh, but what's interesting about this is that during this period, many people uh, 
in, in, in a country that was already facing very high levels of inequality and higher levels of, of, of crime, uh, many people had to return back home. Students, for example, uh, at universities need to be closed back to uh, uh, go back schools, which used to provide uh, uh, food, you know, um, and feeding programs for uh, a school uh, children also need to be closed. So uh, there was bound to be lots of disruptions uh, happening. And also given that many townships were also really highly densely populated areas, uh, there was bound to be uh, lots of disruptions you know, in, in, in people's lives. So in the next slide, I try to show some of uh, uh, the effects on this. So this is uh, uh, a crime statistics, you know, uh, or some of crime statistics between the period uh, um, 27 March to 19 May uh, 2020. It is important to also note that uh, one one of the measures taken during the lockdown it was to ban alcohol, the <laughs> consumption of alcohol uh, at all. It was only in the later levels that uh, uh, alcohol uh, sales and consumption, you know, was sold. In fact. Right now at level one, you can only buy alcohol between Mondays to uh, Fridays and also at certain periods from nine o'clock to about 5 uh, p.m. But you can see here, I mean, uh, between 29 March uh, uh, to 21st May uh, 2019, that uh, the murder, murder rate, even though it looks really high here, <laughs> that it actually dropped. <laughs> I mean, when you compare with the earlier uh, statistics, you know, in uh, uh, January uh, uh, in, in the year. But what's interesting here is to see, you know, um, the GBV, especially uh, violence on women and how that uh, uh, increased during that period, you know, uh, especially with the rape and uh, also violence. If you move to the next slide, the next slide uh, is from the uh, Institute of Security Studies, which is just showing you, you know, the um, uh, uh, a violence, domestic violence, you know, during that period, you know, and, and if you can see, you can see that it's a lot of intimate violence, you know, you, you see uh, frequent quarreling with partners, which is really high. You have uh, 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 violence with uh, two lifetime sexual partners, you know, leading to violence, really high. Uh, you Childhood uh, emotional ab abuse, you know, uh, other transactional sex, sex and depression and other stuff. But what's really key here is that uh, um, violence, uh, domestic violence really increased uh, during this period um, uh, at home. And that's really one of the uh, uh, high consequences of this uh, uh, virus, high consequences of, of the lockdowns, especially for people in this uh, country, already being one of the most unequal countries, you know, um, on, on, on the continent, but also a place of really high violence and one of the one most violent uh, spaces. Yeah, uh, if you move to the next, a slide. In the next slide, I'm just comparing uh, those uh, statistics with uh, uh, different uh, uh, statistics, you know, in the world that this is not just uh, the increase in uh, domestic violence is not just uh, 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 on the African continent or in South Africa. You can see that in France, in Southern Cyprus, Singapore, Argentina, and, and Spain, uh, there's been a percentage increase in domestic violence, you know, due to uh, lockdown measures and uh, pushing people, you know, to uh, live with, uh, with each other. So I try to uh, argue, uh, if you move uh, uh, to, to, to the next slide, by taking uh, a seriously or a CARES call, you know, to move to a time to care, uh, that the virus should not just push us to be thinking uh, about a post-COVID context, but to move to a, a post-self fish context, to move to a context where we can build communities which uh, uh, a place uh, care at the center of uh, uh, organizing a uh, uh, life. And I, I think that's uh, broadly what uh, I, I am trying to, to argue here and that Africa's approach is mainly uh, because of, uh, of care. Thank you so much. Um, I will, I think I can give a few uh, key points maybe while people are planning 
for the questions. Uh, so please feel free to prepare any question for Divine, uh, any clarification question or yeah, and anything that you want. Um, donc dans le, je vais un peu parler en français. Peut-être Christophe aussi pourra pourra compléter. Mais bon, je pense que voilà, Divine nous a proposé un cadrage de de l'épidémie de Covid autour de la notion de care, notion un petit peu intraduisible en français, et, et peut-être précisément parce que la France semble loin d'être une société du care, au sens où, où Divine a essayé de le de le décrire, en nous, en nous incitant à réfléchir à une société, non pas une société... Euh, euh, post-Covid, euh, à laquelle on aspire quand même, euh, mais une société euh, du, du une, une société euh, du, du care, euh, qui serait une société post-égoïsme. Euh, euh, voilà. Et, et, et donc, le, le cadrage autour des sociétés du care, et puis à, à la limite, je vais peut-être euh, intégrer certaines certaines questions. Euh, cette notion de, de société du care euh, euh, semble t'aider à, à, à faire sens de, de, de la gestion de l'épidémie en Afrique. Euh, donc une société qui se serait euh, occupée euh, plus des, des autres et d'une manière qui a permis peut-être de casser les chaînes de transmission. Donc peut-être que je voudrais t'entendre un petit peu plus là-dessus sur euh, d'autant plus que tu parles du, du contexte sud-africain dans lequel le, la, la réponse et l'organisation collective a été quand même assez violente et assez, assez euh, forte en termes de de régime politique. Je crois que la police était vraiment très présente. C'est une société où la violence est extrême. Donc certes, ces, ces mesures ont permis de diminuer la violence et le crime. Et en même temps, on, on fait ressurgir la violence dans l'espace du care euh, intime. Euh, voilà, donc ça, c'est une chose, je pense, que tu as, que tu as montré. Euh, la deuxième chose, je, pour passer plutôt à des questions... Euh, est-ce que donc il y, a, il y a quelque chose de particulier en Afrique du Sud et dans d'autres pays qui euh, qui aurait qui expliquerait euh, la réussite de certaines mesures Peut-être apparemment le, le la la généralisation des tests, euh, les, les chiffres que tu donnes, j'ai pas les chiffres en tête des, des Européens. Est-ce que la, le, le dépistage a été particulièrement réussi, euh, le suivi des contacts, etc. Donc, est-ce qu'il y a quelque chose de spécifique euh, par rapport à ça Peut-être que je te laisse répondre sur ça. Est-ce que Christophe, j'ai pas du tout fait le tour, mais est-ce que tu penses à des, à des choses à ajouter, peut-être sur les statistiques qui t'auraient, que tu voudrais, voilà, partager en termes de clarification non, en fait, je, je crois qu'il y avait un très bon euh, survol de, statistique euh, de la situation. Je n'ai voilà. pas de questions spécifiques. Ok, là, non, mais si, si tu avais, euh, si avais une ou deux euh, façons de, de, de présenter euh, les choses, ce serait… Non, non, j'aurais des questions, mais… D'accord. Je... Donc, euh, voilà, Divine, je regarde peut-être les questions. Euh, oui. Ouais. Est-ce que tu veux répondre pendant ce temps oui, je, okay. je pense qu'il y a deux ou trois questions là. Je, C'est Jean-Baptiste voilà. qui demande euh, <laughs> why I'm arguing that uh, uh, the relationship between care and society that is French incompatibility, you know. <laughs> mm. Yeah. Uh, I mean, just to start with with with, with your question, um, I, I I think a friend this morning was telling me. Again, I emphasize that uh, for once, it is great to be on this continent. For once, you know? Uh, uh, I, I'm not sure. And he, I, you know, he was telling me about Dakar and uh, Senegal and the people who at the start of the pandemic and all of the uh, uh, predictions about the biblical proportion of death and the consequences that this virus was going to have for the continent. You know, it, it was such doom and gloom, which was great also, because I think what it did was uh, to push people to act, uh, to act more. Uh, and uh, I mean, not to be complacent, uh, but I think that over the years, uh, given the way in which Uh, disaster has become part and parcel of everyday life and ordinary life on the continent. Uh, I think many scholars and uh, analysts have, have raised that. Uh, the continent has 
has invested deeply in, in, in the reality of, of disease and the reality of illness and the reality of pandemics. And it, it's not surprising that its response to it, despite its meager resources, uh, is, is actually uh, a, a little bit more effective and efficient than, than many other uh, uh, spaces. So uh, I, I think that the Ebola, for example, we, many countries are just growing out of Ebola. You, you have uh, HIV, many places are just growing out of HIV. So you, you have all of these frequent diseases and illnesses that uh, have become uh, a part and parcel of ordinary and everyday life. And I think these systems in a way have contributed you know, to, uh, to this. And we're seeing the difference between the response systems developed by the US for Ebola in West Africa, which we are unable to apply in the US itself, you know, <laughs> right now, you know, in, 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 in America. So uh, to your question, uh, I think experience of disease and existing infrastructure did contribute enormously. Uh, you know, to, to helping this. Uh, and the fact that the continent uh, developed and created this, uh, this project, the Africa D CDC, the Africa Center for Disease uh, uh, Control, which has really demonstrated, you know, the importance of collaborative work during this uh, uh, period of, uh, of uh, existential uh, threat. I, I, I think, I mean, compared, when you compare uh, what has been happening on this continent in terms of uh, uh, collaborations with countries to do, you know, whether it's testing to look for uh, 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 trials, you know, for, 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 to collect data. Uh, this continent has actually really demonstrated um, uh, that. Uh, yeah, and to, uh, I think it's Jean-Baptiste's question. I don't remember. Yeah, and there's also a question, um by Mathieu, maybe Mathieu, you can you can ask or, or or explain. But I think he he has a comment about you know we in STS studies we we speak uh, most often of a maintenance culture rather than maybe a care culture maintenance of uh, technologies and infrastructure. So do you think that the care culture implied by COVID crisis is also a maintenance culture? maintenance of hospitals and health structures, for instance, but also maintenance of biomedical markets, vaccines, drugs, and masks. What would be your... Yeah, I, I agree, Mathieu. I, I think uh, one, uh, one of the results of, uh, or the positives of outputs of, of COVID is to show us that we can actually have a caring state. <laughs> we can actually have a caring machinery. Uh, you know, we, we have all sorts of issues in the states and this continent, but somehow uh, you, you can see that across the, across the continent, states have risen up to the occasion. I mean, albeit with problems. Uh, so care is something that needs to be, to be maintained. Uh, care is, is something that is continuous. It's a, it's a relationship. A relationship needs to be nurtured. Uh, a relationship, it needs to be cultivated. It needs to be fed. It, 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 and, and, but you need to be able to translate that relationship into a machinery to bring it onto, you know, the state. How do you make the state a caring institution? How do you make the, the state, which is a kind of a machine of violence itself, how do you turn it into a caring? And I think that's a challenge. And I think what crises have done to this place for may, the past years is, is to do that. I, I think COVID humanized the state in a way, even though it also pushed the states to all forms of brutality, because we've seen what states have done across uh, the continent, you know, policing communities, violating people, violating rights, you know, in, in, uh, through lockdown. But, it's also humanized the state to make the state to care, to make the state to think about others, to make the state to, to, th to think about the dignity of other people. And I think that has emerged uh, uh, out of this. So I agree with, uh, with Matthew. Um, 
Yeah, there's also another question by Jean-Baptiste in relation to um, the COVID expansion through migration uh, within uh, SADC countries and um, impact on Southern African politics. There's a remark by Véronique that we cannot ignore uh, care studies in France. I, I agree. Patricia Paperman, Pascal Molinier, Al Agathe, Alice Le Goff, pardon, Fabienne Brugère. So it's more comment, I think. And uh, Christophe, what are exactly the mechanisms linking a caring society to COVID outcomes? Yes. Mm. Those are, are, are very tough questions. Um, yeah, COVID expansion through migration to neighboring countries in SADC for RSA. Yeah, I mean, those, oh, we, we are seeing movement happen, but don't forget that lockdown. <laughs> Many people have been on the lockdown for, for a while, you know. Of course, there's been movement, of course, there's been mobility, but borders have just been open now. Uh, so over the past, uh, over the past months, uh, I think there's been limited mobility. Uh, across borders uh, here. Um, I think that's one. Uh, the second, the impact on Southern African policy, of course, there will always be impact, you know, of course, you know, uh, across the world, nationalism is, uh, ethno nationalism is a big issue right now. Whether you're talking about France, and, you know, where we, it's been very strong for the past uh, uh, years, you know, we, whether it's with the uh, right wing parties or it, with the move towards defining what a state religion is, you know, it's it's really central. Ethno national po politics is part of global politics right now. Whether you're going to the Netherlands or you're going to uh, 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 the US, so South Africa is not excluded from that. And it's not just South Africa, it's Botswana, it's Cameroon, it's, uh, you know, Cote d'Ivoire, where otherness, we are finding it increasingly very difficult to deal with the other. Uh, you know, uh, so it will have an impact. It is having an impact. Uh, and, uh, you know, COVID has caused unemployment, huge unemployment. So we're going to see more of that. <laughs> Many people are losing their jobs. And quite often, the first people to return to is the other, the foreigner. But like uh, Francis Nyamjo would argue, we will keep having these diminishing circles of otherness, you know, because we'll keep pushing and blaming and blaming and blaming, you know, to, uh, to, to, to others. Veronique's question, yeah, uh, it's great. Yeah, I, I think we need to push more for care, <laughs> care studies to make those more visible, bring them to the fore. Uh, but I, I still think that uh, uh, France uh, and French society has a rendezvous with care. <laughs> I think the Republican principle is really, uh, more central uh, than uh, uh, a, a more humanist approach to relationship. I think the ideal in many of these societies we've outsourced care to the state. Uh, I think we have to find a way, you know, uh, to to make our, our obligations towards each other more important than the professionalization. It's like Gassama, you know, Gassama saves this child and everyone treats him as a hero, you know? And then the next thing the first is to professionalize <laughs> that act make him a, a firefighter, make him a citizen, make him an exemplary citizen, you know. What you need to do is to acknowledge the personal, the personality, the, 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 the care, the relationship, the sacrifice, the selflessness. And I think it's those kinds of stuff that we, we should be pushing. For me, that's a caring society. That's a caring society, a society that invests in this infrastructure, which um, Jean-Baptiste was talking about, in those technologies, those uh, care systems. What, what if uh, we, we made uh, a, a public service uh, um, uh, for, 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 for health obligatory rather than uh, public service in the military, you know? What, what if it was compulsory for everyone to, you know, to do health work rather than be in the military? I, I think there are lots of ways that, you know, you can, uh, you, you can do that. And then there was a question about what are exactly the, the mechanisms linking a caring society to uh, a COVID uh, outcomes. I think it's uh, t also taking responsibility. Responsibility is really care. It's, it's really central uh, to care. Uh, responsibility, a kind of a responsibility which does not require reciprocity, uh, that when I'm affected, everyone else is, is affected. You have all of these people who just go out without masks because it's their rights and the freedom to enjoy 
you know, outside, you know? But you have to care to think about other people. If I'm affected, other people are affected. I think that kind of responsibility is really central. It changes the ethic uh, of that society. It, it changes the ethic of government, the government itself, that it's important to preserve the lives of people. It's important to preserve the dignity of people uh, rather than just having compliance issues, you know, uh, uh, passed. I, I think that's the ethos of a caring society, preserving life and a sacrifice, pushing for sacrifice towards uh, others with very little. Uh, Divine, there's so many questions, so I'll try to, I don't know if you prefer to read them, but maybe I'll, I'll, um, I'll, I'll read them. So, Eluid, the crisis of social distancing in society uh, used to close uh, social relations uh, in areas of Africa, both urban and rural. The idea that people cannot visit each other or be in close proximity has posed a crisis in human relations. So how do you see this issue of you know, social distancing? I'll, I'll continue. There is Arlette who has uh, asked for to speak. So Arlette, I will give you uh, uh, in a moment. Uh, do you think Africa's care uh, handling of the pandemic so far makes it prepared for the second pandemic or the second wave, I guess? Mark, do you think that care is generally more important in Africa than in other continents, especially during COVID? Uh, can you give concrete example of the role of care, its impacts uh, during COVID? Uh, maybe same question that uh, Christophe. And Laura wants to raise concern about this issue of care in, you know, not translated in French, and maybe because it's related to the role of the state. state yeah. Um, yeah, and yeah. Uh, social welfare provided by the state. Um, in the context of privatization, the issue has been raised in France about care. So the question is really, you know, um, does the concept of care exists because people still expect the state to respond to their needs. Uh, Veronique is also referring to the work by uh, Cynthia Fleury. And, uh, and yeah, and um, Arlette, maybe if you want to ask your question. Yes, thank you. Thank you for your presentation, Divine. Uh, my question, I have one main question and it's about the crime part of your presentation. I, I'm a bit curious about the source of the data. Is it coming from police report? And if it's coming from police report, how much of this is related to under declaration of people being afraid of going to to, to or not allowed to because of the lockdown? And this relates to the question about how much the lockdown break the relationship, not only this care that the state is trying to to have towards his population, how much is it causing other harms? So this is my question. Thank you. Thank you. <sighs> yeah, so there's so many questions you can maybe, yeah. Okay, let, me, let me start with Arlette. I, I mean, this, just to say, this is an experiment. So uh, the idea that care, uh, Care and republicanism is uh, the republican ethic. Uh, there's a tension between care and the republican ethic. I think that's an experiment, and I'm loving it. I think it's a way to experiment with <laughs> with ideas. And uh, I'm also just trying to deploy uh, part of the debate on decolonization. I'm, and, and I'm trying to argue that uh, there was a uh, the, the the French Revolution. Uh, uh, and uh, the move towards uh, uh, a strong state and rights-based uh, society uh, in a way outsourced care to the state and also devalued it as a personal relationship, it dehumanized care. I, I think partly that's what I'm trying to, to argue, but uh, I, I have to work on it, but uh, it's a provocation. It's a, it's a challenge also that I'm, I'm throwing, but I think to solve to, to answer that question, we have to go back with the storming of the Bastille and see, you know, what drove the storming of the Bastille and what happened after that. And I think we, we left care at the stairs of the Bastille. Once it came down and there was fraternity and liberty and everything, then we moved to uh, a Republican state where 
the ethic of the state was more important and your relationship and duty to the state became more important because you outsourced it like social welfare, et cetera, et cetera, which you've outsourced to the state. Um, and that, of course, has its own consequences, you know, because uh, what happens when the state cannot, doesn't really know what to do or what happens when the, the state is confused or what happens when the state is taken over, you know, by careless people? Uh, we need to ask those questions. That's one. Uh, and I let, yeah, statistics are very problematic, you know. They're really, really problematic. But uh, it is good that we're having some statistic that we, we are at least having statistics to interrogate, to interrogate the inadequacy of that statistic and how it is collected. But what I've done here is to take statistics from two sources, some statistics from police, statistics from the uh, Institute of Security Studies, which also depends on the police and uh, all that. It's really difficult because there's a lot of underreporting. And uh, these statistics, once they were published, uh, were highly challenged. Uh, not just by activists across the country, uh, but also feminists, you know, and others, you know, that uh, yeah, they, they are lots of uh, uh, people who uh, get um, a double violation, like you people, a woman violated goes to the police and again, repeat violation that you don't really want to turn out to the police to repeat. There are also all sorts of structures which determine what you go uh, to report. There's also custom, culture, and other things which prevent people from reporting. And, you know, but a lot of the statistics shows that uh, calls uh, uh, for uh, help, uh, calls for assistance and call lines see, saw an increase and reporting during that period that people were locked down. So that's already an indication that there is something, the lockdown did have an effect on people. By having people uh, uh, together, actually there was an increase you know, uh, uh, in, in, in violations. Uh, many of the other questions? Um, I think you covered them and I have a, a question yeah. if I can. Okay. Oh, or maybe it's a remark. Uh, but I, I would say that uh, an, maybe an example or, or illustration of your idea of care republicanism is, of course, France. And what I see as, um, as an, an, an example is the COVID response in France and the idea that it's only about public health, right? It's only about um, like sanitary measures. And it's totally um, uh, having hospital as, as being, you know, central and the central response and, and rights, you know, rights to a, a bed in a hospital. So everything yeah. is organized around the idea that we should all be able to have a bed and a, a let's say, resuscitation bed, uh, un lit de réanimation. Uh, yeah. And so everything is indexed here on um, the capacities of hospitals, and 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 really, I think my my fellow citizens uh, can 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 add. But I think there's n you know nothing in the public discourse in the state about other kinds of responses, like uh, of course family, intimate um, needs, um, interpersonal care, uh, and also even the 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 complex web of, you know, uh, family doctors or, or um, other forms of, um, of uh, health care that we have. It's only s the, the hospitals, big hospitals and their big heads of services and, their, and the number of, of resuscitation bed. And I think that's, that's a case of your, yeah, republicanism and, and COVID response um, only about rights and not about care, I think. Um, yeah. Yeah, and France has been in a lockdown more than anyone. Mm. You know, you you you've been in a lockdown like for long, even long before COVID. You were under lockdown. You were under a state of emergency. You know, before anyone else. Uh, and it will be interesting to see, you know, what shifted. You know, what's different because the, you you have a very uh, central and dominant state. You know, you. Your rights, you know, have been ma managed and taken away, uh, you know, by by by, by the state. So, um, but uh, Munyai asked the question, and uh, I think Munyai, Munyai, I think your question should 
really get a response from the the Africa CDC because I think the the there is a kind of a coordinated process from the Africa CDC to try to prepare a lot of the continents for for the next waves and every uh, country is is doing its best you know to put things in place within the means limited means at their disposal and also to prepare for a time when their citizens also if there's a, a vaccine they will be able to have access to this vaccine so they are looking for uh, yeah, i think the african the uh, african union in collaboration with the african cdc have now put this platform for collective uh, procurement, you know, there, there, there are lots of stuff that's happening just to ensure that uh, there is better preparation for that phase. If it works, that's another question, you know, when these things happen, you know, everybody starts acting as if they've been taken, you know, on our ways, uh, really. Est-ce qu'il y a d'autres questions en français, si vous voulez Euh, oui, moi j'aurais une autre question. Oui, Christophe. Euh, let me put my... euh, Divine, I have another question. I've just read a, a, a study recently published, and it shows that um, African, sub-Saharan African countries were somehow privileged. Uh, in terms of um, their age structure yeah. compared to the rest of the world, and that uh, it helped uh, explain part of the low COVID-19 death rates in, in these countries. And here I think uh, within Sub-Saharan Africa, we might even see uh, variations between countries like South Africa, which is somehow older or less young than other countries in, for instance, in Western Africa, like Mali, typically, which is one of the youngest uh, population in, in, in the world. So would that make sense to you? And would that also apply to um, South Africa itself, differences between regions, between uh, communities, between localities? Yeah, uh, I, I, I think it is the case. Uh, there's not much I can, I can add to that. Uh, the, the, the science tells us that age is a factor. Age affects it, and and we have seen because uh, Europe's got a very high aging population that it's actually uh, highly affected uh, Europe. What what should be happening with Europe is that Europe should be trying to compare, for example, with Japan. You know, uh, in other spaces where you have higher aging populations, and and try to understand, you know, what. What did they have right and what did they have wrong? Uh, but here, age is a factor. It's mainly the South Africa is a very young population. A lot of the continent has a very young population, and it seems like the, the virus uh, doesn't hit really hard on that population. And uh, there is also a lot of asymptomatic cases and also uh, high recovery. But but I think it's a that's just an just one aspect. I think there's many other aspects that you have to take into consideration. Uh, the context, the, the system, the way the, the, the state, the health system itself, which has been tested and retested for years and years uh, uh, by one pandemic or the other. And the fact that there's been response teams and the kinds of practice done, you would want to think that uh, for years, European society has seemed to have also forgotten what it means to have a pandemic, you know, what it means to have, uh, or what it means for hospitals to experience it. And I think we should not forget that, that that uh, uh, people have taken some of these things for granted. Uh, people have taken some of fear for granted, the fear for disease, the fear for illness, the fear to fall ill, and this resilience, you know, the, the borders open and people start traveling from one part of the country to the other. You know, <laughs> in, 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 I mean, in, in France, in Europe, you know, people, there's this thing, restlessness, which I think is this Republican thing that I am this individual, I'm this person, I have a right and I, I must experience it. And in, in other places, you know, 
if I get sick, it's not just my family. It's just that there's no bread we know for my mother, you know, it affects my mother, affects someone else. So there's another kind of connection. So I'm thinking not just about myself, but uh, um, other range of people. Um, yeah. Okay. Uh, let me see if there is maybe a last question somewhere. I see that we have uh, colleagues from, I know Nairobi, but maybe from South Africa too. Please feel free to share any insight. We'll be happy to to hear you. <laughs> so, but uh, Idzai is asking whether uh, you would share your your presentation, Divine. Um, sure. And yeah, we'll. Yes, I'm happy to. It's just a. Uh public stuff and a lot of the stats I get is I got them from public from the Ministry of Health from the WHO and also from uh, uh, different dashboards in South Africa Africa CDC ISS you know every body now has a dashboard which is all connected you know to central uh, space mm. so I'm, I'm happy to share okay yes so if there's no other questions um please still time <laughs> to ask but i i must say that i'm happy to hear that it's a, it's a really good time to be in africa we are i think most of us we are we are used to working um in uh, in africa and we miss that a lot uh, we can also yeah un make um try to make sense out of this you know privation we are we we cannot go um in africa and this frustration <laughs> i think it's also good to experience maybe but um i hear that it's um, yeah it's um, it's um, seems somehow important to 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 say that it's good to be in africa right now and you and and your colleagues and and your and countries have so many important insights to share about what it is to experience such a pandemic, what it is to experience uh, states shortcomings, um, state violence and, um, and, uh, and fear <laughs> about the future. So I, I want to thank you warmly for sharing um, your, your proposition and your thoughts provoking aspects of your work about care and, and, and South Africa. So, yes, um, Divine has uh, sent his uh, email address and you are very free to ask for a copy of the presentation or for any other questions, really. So thank you to all CEPED colleagues and colleagues in South Africa and Nairobi. Thank you, Divine. It has been a pleasure, really. And um, yeah. Merci. Thank you, Merci guys. Merci beaucoup. Merci beaucoup.